Uh, if you want to take your Bibles and turn with me to Proverbs chapter 1, we're going to continue our blazing journey through a verse at a time. Um, but as you're turning there, I just want to give you two, two uh, uh, announcements or things to, to think about. Number one is if you could pray for Karen Cates. She is, uh, she's currently in the hospital over in Fargo. She has had a very mild heart attack. I say mild as in it's one of those that you don't realize you're having anything going on, but there's enough pain and problems that are there. So they're just running the tests and making sure everything is okay. Hopefully she's coming home today as it goes, but just keep her in your prayers. Uh, and second, as far as the ladies' conference goes, I need six to eight men. We are going to serve the ladies that day. Okay, so uh, we will be, we're not cooking the lunch, but we will be given the lunch. <laughs> we may sample the lunch, uh, you know, but we are going to, we're going to set everything out. We're going to clean everything up. It is our turn to serve and let them just be ministered to. So if you are available on that day or if you can make that time available, please see me. Uh, we want to make sure that we serve in a very, very solid manner. And for you ladies, I have the, uh, the copy of notes of what is going to be talked about. So you're in for, for quite a day. Uh, if you have any hard questions, please save them for my mother. <laughs> I know she's going to be watching this and she'll yell at me later. But for now, it'll be, uh, it'll be good. Um, but today, today we are in Proverbs chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at verses uh, 1 through 3, mainly highlighting verse 3 as we go. So if you want to just read with me as we, we're going to read through the, the seven verses again. And by the time I finally get to verse 7, you might actually have these memorized as it goes. But it says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, just, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Heavenly Father, as we open up your word today, as we dive into the rich vastness of your word, Father, I, I pray that you would speak to us on multiple levels. Number one, that we see you as a very big God, as the creator, as sovereign, as holy. Father, but I also pray that we see you through the eyes of responsibility today, that we have the desire and the need to put your word into practice in our lives for holy living, for your honor, for your glory, Father. Lord, I know there's going to be some truths that are, are very pointed, as your word always is. May we embrace them instead of reject them. May we analyze them. May we love them. Father, I just, uh, I just pray this today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So in my studies, I was, I came across uh, uh, just a little, a little quote from Charles Spurgeon that I want to share with you as we start things off this morning, when he says, "Discernment is not a matter of simply telling the difference between right and wrong; rather, it is telling the difference between right and almost right." The verse three of what we are talking about today is the discernment. Between good and evil, that's what verse 3 really talks about. And just because something might be good, it may not be the best decision that we have to make that day or at that moment or in that time. And it requires prayer, it requires uh, dedication and discernment to understand what the goodwill of the Lord is. So as you think about this, the, the discernment of what is good and evil. Well, if you're going to know what is good and evil, you have to understand who God is. You have to see God as he reveals himself and not in how we want to make him to be. Right? God is God just the way he is. And we need to remember that each and every single day. 
How many people do you think are wise in your network of friends? Right? That's, that's the question. Because there's always that one individual, or maybe even multiples, but it's usually a very small select few who you consider to be people of wisdom. And often so, it's because of their, their greatness with the Lord, or their passion, their relationship that is with the Lord God. See, when it comes down to wisdom, a wise man can tell the difference between right and wrong in any situation they are in. Why? Because they are sensitive to the truth of God and they are sensitive to what is opposite, what is sinful. When we, when we are studying Proverbs, and as we continue to study Proverbs, everything again comes out of verse 7. This is the introduction to the introduction, pretty much, but it all comes out of the fear of the Lord. But Proverbs briefly and very clearly describes foolishness as a sin. It is a sin, for the act of foolishness, does, it, it simply denies the wisdom of God. If you think about this from a biblical standpoint, the first act of foolishness was not found in the book of Proverbs, it was found in the book of Genesis. Okay, Eve, if we look at the story just of Adam and Eve, and you don't need to turn there unless you desire to, but I'm just going to reference this since most of everybody knows the story of, of Adam and Eve. Eve listened to the voice of the serpent. That's what it came down to. She listened to the voice of the serpent instead of relying on the earlier instruction from her husband and from the Lord. She sought her wisdom from a foreign voice. Adam listened to the voice of his wife coming from the serpent over the Lord, someone he greatly loved, but it was not the truth that God has spoken, and therefore he listened to a voice of wisdom that did not have godly truth in it. Both, at their, in their moments of choosing, chose to seek and obey wisdom apart from God and apart from his word. That is the basis of foolishness. That is Proverbs in a nutshell. If you choose to seek counsel and advice apart from God and his holy word, you are choosing to be a foolish individual. And the sad aspect is that foolishness is sin that leads to death. That's where foolishness leads 100% of the time. It leads away from the Lord. And if you follow that long enough, you will choose against the Lord. Where wisdom is righteousness that leads to life. It leads to eternal life. It leads to forgiveness. It leads to redemption. It leads to Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our God. Therefore, we have to submit to the Word of God. We have to submit to the Word of God. And this is where we run into a problem culturally as we continue to talk about the Word of God is outdated and irrelevant. Yet, when you read it, it continues to be right 100% of the time. It's amazing what God says is always right. See, we have to submit to the word of God and not what we think is right. There is a very large difference. All right, the word of God is right because God said it is. What we think is right is based off of many factors that go in, and we may not always be right. See, we can't rely on what seems right in our own eyes. So let me tell you, there's a, there's a few problems within the church that has existed for many, many years. Let me start off with things that we agree with, though. If you are a true follower of Christ, if there is a, a genuine Christian from all, all over the world, any age, any time, just about every Christian will agree that wisdom is found in the Word of God, and it is the Word of God, and it is God. Would you agree with that? Right, okay, now we're, that's better, okay. I'm going to ask you a second question, so just be prepared. <laughs> Most Christians agree that we should submit to what the will of God is and the word of God in all areas of life. Do you agree with that? Okay, here's the problem. The exception comes in when it applies to our own life. All right, we know it shouldn't, but we make exceptions on the sinful side of things when it applies to our own life. Let me give you some very pointed, very direct examples that have been used many, many years by many, many different people. If this steps on your toes, maybe you need it. I don't know. But here's what it is. 
I know God's word says, I have no grounds for a divorce, but surely God wants me just to be happy. Right? I know I should submit to my husband, but have you met that guy? Uh, he is crazy. These are real, by the way. I've heard these for years. <laughs> I know I should love my wife, but she just nags me all the time. Do you see how irritating she is? I know God wants me to be generous, but times are tight right now and I can't afford to give anything. I know I shouldn't speak profanities, but I hear it all day at work and I just can't help myself. Surely the Lord will forgive me. I know I should love my neighbor, but wouldn't it be easier if they just moved further away? <laughs> right? Or, let me give you the last one. This is just the tip of the iceberg of what I'm sharing with you. I know I need to read my Bible more, but I work all the time and I'm just so tired. We know what is wisdom. We know what is right. We know that we should submit to the will of God, but we justify and make excuses when it comes to our own personal life. We do this. We struggle with it. We battle with it. And by the faithfulness and greatness of God, you can also overcome all of these things. But on that sinful side, because we still have that fleshly desire that resides within us until God takes us home, we find all kinds of excuses to evade submission to his word. When we lean, what is, when we lean on what is right in our own eyes, because foolishness makes you believe that you know more than what God knows. That is foolishness in its nature. Instead, we need to submit to the wisdom of God that is found in his word, that instructs us, that gives us discernment on what is good and what is evil. Please keep your finger here. We'll get back to it very shortly. But turn over with me to Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 4. In the first 10 verses, we find out what wisdom and foolishness is way before Proverbs was ever written. Very interesting how God continues to tell us the truth from beginning to end in his word. He says, Now, O Israel, and I will tell you, you could, you could put in, O church, in its place. But he says, Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. Now, here's the great key verse that comes with this, that starts all of this off. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. This is wisdom, the definition of wisdom. Do not add to the word of God. Do not take away from the word of God exactly as the Lord reveals it to us is everything that we need. He goes on, he says, your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor. For the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. I want to remind you and encourage you to remember the things that the Lord is doing in this world today. What the Lord has done in your life, how he has changed things, saved you perhaps, hopefully everyone knows that truth today, how he has rescued you, how he has defended you, how he continues to love and provide for you. But that key verse in four, but you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today. There is no, uh, no coincidence of why we are holding on to 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Hold fast what is good. And what is good is God and his commandments, his holy word. He goes on, he says, Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore, be careful to observe them. Right? Be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all of these statutes. Do you understand what he is saying here? Be, her be careful to hear the commandments of God because that is your wisdom and instruction. 
not what people have to say, not what other people worship, not how far your feet travel. The word of God is your wisdom and instruction. And he goes on and he says, and surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people, and that's if they understand and follow the commandments. It says, for what great nation is there that has God so near to it? as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you today? Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Take heed that you do not forget the word of God, Take heed that you do not replace it with something else. You have a great God that you can call on day or night, and he is willing, ready, eager to hear. You have a great God who continues to pass down righteous judgments to lead you in the path of holiness. You have a great God who takes the time to warn you of the dangers ahead if you choose someone else. To follow. But he gives this last reminder in verse 10. He says, Especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children. It's amazing how Proverbs says the same thing as Deuteronomy, the beginning of all knowledge and wisdom. It's through the fear of the Lord. We remember that our God is a creator. We remember that our God is sovereign. We remember that he is all-powerful. We remember that he holds us in the palm of his hand. We remember that while we were enemies, he saved us. We remember that our responsibility, whether people want to hear it or not, whether our children want to hear it or not, is to teach them the statutes of God, the commandments of God. This is what we are talking about now. Wisdom is found in keeping God's commandments. Wisdom is found in fearing the Lord. Foolishness is found in denying all of it. Why are we in a sin-cursed world, or why do we struggle with the people we do right now? It's because they have forgotten the truth of God. They have forgotten and then turned into denying the truth of God and figured out that the word of God is not important to them. And as such, they act foolish. It's very, very disconcerting as we think about this. But I want to share with you this. If you turn back to Proverbs chapter 1, here's the, the truth of of the word as it comes. If you look at that first word, wisdom, in verse 2, and then you see the word wisdom again in verse 3, they are not the same words. The first word is wisdom in general as a whole. By the time you get to verse 3, it is the art of wisdom, the ability to, to specify and learn specific things, such as if you were Learning your craft, whatever it is, your job, your sport, your music, you spend very specific time learning how to do that aspect better and more proficient. That is the aspect of wisdom. But to understand this, you have to, you have to see that wisdom here is talking about moral conduct. And if you don't have moral conduct that is found in God, you do not have godly wisdom. Because God requires a high moral standard. There's a difference between godly logic and human logic. He's saying that a life that is led by doing what is right in front of his eyes will give you life. If you look at the word instruction, to receive instruction of wisdom in verse 3, this word instruction really means to provide correction and discipline. Just the phrase that we absolutely love. I love to be disciplined. It is my favorite thing. If you have ever, uh, ever you ever talked about uh, uh, things with the Lord and the Lord says, no, you're wrong, let me show you. 
You think, no, I think, I'm, I think I'm wiser, I think I'm greater, I think I understand a few more things. And then he provides a little extra discipline. And then you have a very discouraging day until you come to the spot of, maybe I should just submit. Things would be more peaceful along the way, and then they become more peaceful along the way. But this is what God does to receive the instruction or the discipline of wisdom, the correction of wisdom. You actually have to be willing to receive it. God is going to provide it. Are you willing to receive it in the disciplined aspects of your life? Turn with me just a few chapters to Proverbs 13, 24. It talks very much about this because the relationship that God has with us is often or, or is formatted uh, uh, to be displayed in our parental relationships with our kids. It's a verse that we well know. It's a verse that is, is said by parents. It's a verse that is quoted by pastors many times and it has great meaning. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. But if you notice, there's two different aspects that go in this verse. It's a two-part message that goes with this. It says, he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Okay? To refrain from discipline. To refrain from discipline is defined as an act of hate. For us as parents, if we fail to discipline our children, we are treating them as an enemy instead of a son and daughter. That is what it comes down to in biblical instruction. To love your children, we have to provide correction. We have to provide chastisement. But we have to do it in a quick time frame so they understand that the actions that are there are not leading toward life. They're potentially leading toward death or greater harm for themselves and for people around them. I know what the world says today. The world says kids have the ability to decide what is right and wrong, and I'm telling you that they are the most foolish people you will ever listen to. If you, who are in your adult years, had good parents, for those of you who had good parents, okay, by the time you were in your 30s, you finally realized the lessons you were taught when you were 6 through 10. By the time you hit the 40s, you realize the lessons you were taught between 10 and 14. And then in the rebellious years that come after that, normally you're sitting with dad in the rocking chair on the front porch thinking, man, he probably knew some stuff back then I should uh, share with some other people. No child understands the full extent of what you are talking about until it is later in their life. If you think I am wrong, do you understand that everything God says to you is right when he says it is right? At that moment, usually it takes a little bit to sink in. And thankfully, as a loving parent, he does it with us over and over and over again. If you flip back to chapter 1, you will see this also listed out in, in verses 1 through 3, which is great. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this too, but he says this two-part message to know wisdom in verse one, right? It says, or in verse two, starting off to know wisdom, you actually have to be able to receive wisdom in verse three. You see how those go together to know God. You have to receive the discipline, the training, the instruction of God. If you aren't willing to receive it, you will not know in the full extent. For we as kids, have we ever spent the time asking the right questions? Mom or dad, why did you discipline me in this manner? Instead of, I don't like you. I don't like it. Because we get a greater explanation. You were doing this. I tried to tell you that you were doing this, and these are the effects of it. And it was not sticking. But because I loved you, I was giving it to you anyway. This is what comes from verse 1 and 3. To know wisdom, to know the discipline, to know the correction that comes from God, we actually have to be willing to receive it. I want you to remember today that the Lord disciplines you because he loves you. He loves you. He pours out instruction. 
He gives you a high standard of morality because it is what you need, is what I need, is what everybody needs. With every bit of discipline in that instruction comes life. With every bit comes life because life is found in the holiness of God and that is what we are striving after. But here's what our culture is teaching in opposition to our or to God's design, to the instructions that we have been giving. Here's the problems that we have right now that we currently deal with. Children are telling parents what they need to do, what they are going to do, and parents believe that letting them is an act of love. It is not. I will clearly state it again. If your children are going to tell you how to live, you have already allowed, you've, you've allowed them to choose death. That's quite simple how it goes. I know it's very pointed, but we're talking about life in the Word of God in Jesus Christ. Your job as a parent, from the biblical instruction, teach them who God is. Teach them the commandments that they may remember it, Deuteronomy chapter 6, that they may not stray from it when they get older. Does that mean they're not going to be rebellious? Have you met a child? Of course they're going to be rebellious. Have you met an adult? Of course they're going to be rebellious. Okay, we have those aspects. But we as parents, we believe God, we trust in God that his word is going to work always and forever. Because God is eternal. It is an act of love. So ultimately, this is a picture of what God's children attempts to do with him. And I think you could probably put yourself in this at one point or another. When we cry out and we make these statements and says, God! Now notice I did not say Lord God, because we take the Lord out before him, and we're going to put it back in in just a moment when we make these statements. I'm going to do what I want to do. My plan is better. I like my way. You're not meeting my desires. I am better. I am wiser than you. I am right you are wrong. This is an act of rebellion. This is what happens as we go about things. Only God says, because he loves you, and praise the Lord that he does, because we've had moments of this rebellion from a large fashion, in whatever age group, it does not matter. So God says, no. You can say as much as you want to, and I'm still going to love you because you need it. That is a great father. He provides discipline. But he also provides judgment. He takes things away from you. This is one of the things. All right, now I'm going to say this and probably get me in trouble. It's not the first time. <laughs> Parents, take stuff away from your kids, please. Discipline. If you don't remove things from them, they will only expect you to give them back quickly or no discipline is coming at all. All right? You can decide what length of time that is, but please follow the Lord's example. The Lord is regular to take things away from you, is he not? Blessing, favor, stuff, people. He does it all throughout biblical history until you remember who he is. And then he brings it back. Right, even to the point of not answering prayers and requests until they remember who he is, until they repent, until they turn away from their rebellion. And once that happens, it is no longer a crying out for God. It is a crying out for my Lord God, because you are submissive to his will once again. We have a, we have a real problem of parenting in our world because they have denied the wisdom of truth they have denied the lord the lord god now there is no one size fits all as you know that all kids are different you know that all adults are different but the fact of the matter is that truth needs to be applied discipline needs to be implied because we don't understand the things that are coming until someone teaches us and god does this and if you look back at verse 2 it says to receive or to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. And the word for understanding is often translated into the word discernment. 
So in order to perceive the words of discernment, to know wisdom and instruction is the ability to discern what is good and evil, what is right from wrong. And if you take that word understanding, you can really put the uh, definition of godly intelligence in there. And godly intelligence comes from the word of God. And if you don't know the word of God, you're not going to know what is right from wrong, and you won't get the modern, or, or I should say, and, you, and instead you get the modern day culture and philosophies based off of feelings, entitlement, and self-autonomy. If you think I am wrong, you need to read the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes is also the same writer that wrote much of Proverbs, where he says, when you only look under the sun... When you only live under the sun, everything is meaningless. But when God is involved, that's where life is. That's where our meaning is found. Where wisdom is found is not under the sun. It is the God who created everything and holds it. Simply put, if you don't know the word of God, then you become a spiritually feeble-minded Christian. You become spiritually brain dead. Now, I don't know about you, but that is not my desire for anybody. Whether they know the Lord God yet or not, I pray that your desire is for more of the straight truth of God, the Word of God. Because here's the Lord's expectation, here's his design that we use our learned intelligence coming from his word right, to honor him with a life of righteousness and a life of holiness. That is his expectation. If you look at, flip over with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. Keep your finger in Proverbs still. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 10 through 12. He says, for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, who would, who would love life. Okay, This is all from Psalm 34. And he would seek good days. You have to refrain from doing something which God calls evil. How are you going to know that if we're not in the Word of God? We cannot keep our, or we have to keep our lips from speaking deceit, to turn away from his evil and do good. How do you know what is good unless somebody defines it for you and that somebody is our Lord God? For it says very clearly, his ears are open to those who seek after what is right instead of what is wrong. For his face is against those who do evil but he longs to answer those requests to lead people who are chasing after what is good, who are using discernment. You can't know good. Right? You can't know peace. You can't pursue peace. You cannot pursue wholesome speech if you do not know what the Lord says in his holy word, if you do not have an ongoing relationship with him. Now, I much would prefer that the Lord would stand up for me and stand up instead of standing up against me. You have that choice to make. Do I want the Lord standing before me on behalf of me, guiding me, leading me, or do I want him standing against me? Because Ecclesiastes, again, will tell you that the Lord will answer and repay you for your good and your evil. Which is why we get back to Proverbs chapter 1. When he says, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. And I want to break these things down for you. Justice. Boy, isn't that a tainted word nowadays? Well, here's what God says. He says, what is morally and judicially right. What is righteous before God as he has defined it. That is what justice is. More specifically, what is right is what God says is right. Okay, there's our argument. How do you know what is right? Because God said it. That's my argument. 
I don't need to say anything else because God already defined it. He is the light of all the universe. He is everything, or, or everything that is not of God is darkness. This is very clear, black and white, scriptural understanding. He created everything. He sustains everything. He decides the standard. He is the truth and therefore gives us the truth. He is our everything. Light is right. Memorize it. Remember it. If God is light, God is right. There you go. See, mankind defines what is right, not in the, in the manner that God does, but the sinful man defines what is right by averaging the, the actions of people. And the middle becomes the standard. And by doing so, the truth becomes relative and nothing becomes absolute because it's always changing. The average always changes throughout cultures and time. And therefore, selfishness and immorality reign as king. See, God's standard never changes. It's always the top. It's not in the middle. It's the top because that is where life is. I tell you again, the light is right. Now, you can take justice and, you look, and look at the next word of judgment. And judgment gives us a couple things to think about. Because all you hear when people talk about is judgment is, you're not supposed to judge one another. Well, you make judgments about people all the time. All the time. Let me tell you what you're supposed to do when it comes to judgment. Were you aware that godly wisdom enables you to make judgments all throughout this life? Right, here's the first one. You have to make judgments lawfully. If you are in any position of leadership or you are in a position of, of government in any case, you have to be able to hear two sides of a conversation, perhaps many more. You have to have the ability to test them for weaknesses and irregularities. But most importantly, you have to be able to measure them up against God's standard, and a standard is his word. Then you can make a judgment on what is right, off of what God said is right. Right? That is the act of judgment. But you also make judgments in making decisions. Everyday life decisions, you are making judgments right and left, and you're comparing them to some sort of truth. You have to analyze. You have to gather data. You have to sift constantly through information from all over, from all sorts of, of avenues. And again, you have to take it and measure it against what is right, the word of God. What God calls right and wrong. And then you have to decide, does that course of action actually meet and most honor the Lord? Does it honor the family? And does it honor people around you or that you oversee? In both cases, in both cases, I will tell you, it has to be brought before the Lord prayerfully. These are not snap decisions, and it has to be measured against the word of God discerningly. Prayer and discernment go hand in hand with every decision that you make on a regular basis. Justice and judgment. Now we get into this word equity. Now I will tell you, I have a problem with this word culturally, because it just makes me angry when I hear people talk about it. Here's why. People believe that making things even for everybody is the same as honoring them. It's not equity. It's not how God defines equity. This is how this word is actually described. It is the evenness in both justice and judgment. Okay? It is evenness in justice and judgment. Again, going back to the correction and discipline of wisdom. Right? Equity is found in the uprightness in conduct, in ethics, in morality, in the standard of God that he has already set. Standing honorable, pure, and pleasing before the Lord. That is the goal. It has never changed. I don't care what word or definition you want to try to throw in there. Standing honorable, pure, and pleasing before the Lord. This is what God is going to do when you and I stand before him at his throne. He's going to take the actions that were done. Right? If you are a Christian, and you don't have to face the great judgment of being separated with him. That's great. So here's what happens. You stand before him and say, all right, here's the things that should have been done. Here's the things that was done. Here is your reward as a result. 
Justice and judgment equally being measured out because he is the judge and king. He did not say that I'm going to average things out and make things all nice and peaceful for you. He's going to say, I'm going to give you what you worked for. That's our God. That is equity. That is not how it's defined in our culture today. Now, every decision you make, as you well know, if you have read the word of God just a little bit, is not listed out in black and white in the scriptures. Some are. Some say, do this, don't do this. Other times, they do not. But God gives us guiding principles to walk straight before him from Genesis to Revelation all the way through. Let me give you some practical aspects with this when it comes to receiving the instruction of wisdom to be able to provide justice, judgment, and equity in your life. If you cannot make your decision with honor, if you cannot make your decision with enthusiasm and joy and conviction that is rooted in the word of God, then you cannot choose that direction. Very simply put. If your decision favors you over the two great commandments of loving God and loving people around you, then you cannot make that decision. If your conscience is bothered after your decision, you made a wrong one. Very simply put. Why? Because it, every decision of this nature needs to be prayerfully and full of discernment with the word of God. As J. Vernon McGee once said, he says, Happy is the man whose conscience does not condemn him in the things which he allows. When in the next hour or the next day you sit back and think, I probably shouldn't have done that. That is a bothered conscience that needs to be repented of, needs to be dealt with. There's some questions that we need to ask in this regard when it comes to these these principles that God lists us out. Do you ever realize that parables are mostly principles that he gives us? Here's two things. He says, will my actions offend God? This is for us. Will my actions offend God? When I pray about it, when I compare it with scripture, will the choice that I want to make offend God or will it honor him? See, we don't take the time to stop and ask these questions when we have the, the ability to do so. And the second one is this. Will my actions cause someone around me to sin. Going back to Spurgeon, from right to almost right, will my actions cause somebody around me to sin? And you need to be sensitive enough to know the struggles of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Though it may not be unlawful, if it leads my brother or sister to sin, you do not do it for their relationship with the Lord, for their honor. That is simply how it works. But I will tell you this, it requires complete dependence on God and we don't get this right all the time. We struggle with it regularly, but God is faithful to lead us in his wisdom. He is faithful to lead us to life. And in order to have wisdom, it must come from the source of all wisdom as the reminder. All wisdom depends on the knowledge of God and the submission to his will. This is simply put, if we were going to look at this, if we jump to verse 7 and it tells us fools despise wisdom and, and instruction. Here's the simple statements that go with this. Fools reject the fear of the Lord. Wisdom understands that fearing the Lord builds the foundation for holy living. Fools love to glory in their sin. They love to glorify their sin. Wisdom glorifies the holiness of God. There's a big difference. Just think about that as we chase after the fear of the Lord. Oswald Chambers even went a step further in just a, one of his writings. He says, the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. What else is there to be afraid of? For I look at my God as the ruler, the holder, the sustainer, the creator of all. And if he has promised to hold me for all of eternity, what am I afraid of? 
So let me encourage you this morning as we think about this, to know wisdom, to perceive the words of discernment, to receive the instruction, the discipline, the correction of wisdom, to look at justice, judgment, and equity in the biblical viewpoint as God has defined it. Let me tell you these last few brief statements. Do not be afraid to fear your God. I challenge you, I encourage you to embrace it. Do not be afraid to receive the correction and the discipline of your God, your loving Father, because he is pouring out the most pure form of love that in those moments what we desperately need. Please learn, study the difference between good and evil. How do we do that? We study the word of God. Finally, as far as wisdom goes, let God mold you into a skilled soldier for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what God's wisdom does. It gives you the truth of life to be able to wield it, use it, and strike it home for those who need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is everybody you're going to meet. We must love wisdom. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, there is much for us to learn about wisdom. There is much for us to learn about how you define things. Lord, our definitions change over time, but I praise you, Father. We praise you, Father, that you do not change. Your word does not change. Your truth does not change. It is forever beneficial, edifying, building, necessary. Lord, even though we may struggle and we don't like it, I pray that everybody here would cry out and say, thank you for your discipline, Father. I know it is because you love me. I know it is because you do not want to see me lost in sin. I know that it is because you want to see me made righteous through the sacrificial love of your son, Jesus Christ. Above all, I know it is for your glory and it will bring you honor and praise. I know I did not deserve it. And it was completely of your work that you brought me here this day. I know without you I cannot understand truth and you continue to pour it out to me. Father, we say thank you today that your word instructs us from beginning to end that wisdom is found in our relationship with you. It is found in your absolute truth, your scriptures, your word. Father, I, I praise you today that even in those many times that we struggle, we get it wrong, and we don't use it, we listen to the voice of you know, outsiders or outside knowledge and wisdom, just as Adam and Eve did, you are faithful to forgive as your word tells us. May we be quick to repent. May we rejoice in you. May we be hungry for more of what you define of what is good and seek to put it on in our life. Lord, may we be followers of you who do not make exceptions for our own personal lives, but live by your standard. Thank you, Father, for even making that possible, for leading, for guiding, for pouring out abundantly you. We praise you today, Father. Our life is found in you. We glorify you today. We just pray this in the name of our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you take your, your Bibles and flip over to me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we are going to partake in communion today. It is fitting. As last week we celebrated our 150th anniversary it is fitting that we continue to rejoice and celebrate the goodness of God. I, for those of you who may be new with us today, I'm going to give you the same speech. 
that I regularly give, everybody is welcome. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are welcome to participate in communion with us. The Word tells us very clearly, if you do not know the Lord, to partake in communion would bring judgment from the Lord, and I would encourage you to not partake and honor the Lord in that fashion. My deepest and greatest prayer would be that you would submit to the will of God today and call out on Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and we may rejoice with you. But here's what I'd like to do is, as we open up the word, as we begin, uh, just for a short little piece of communion here in celebration and rejoicing of the Lord, if you would please bow your head. Just spend a few moments telling the Lord why you are thankful for him today, why you love him today, or perhaps you are in that spot where you need to repent and confess and seek after the full restoration of God. That is an act of love as well. But just take a few minutes and, and talk with the Lord this morning. Father, again, we say thank you. Lord, you are, you truly are our loving Father, our heavenly Father. When we don't know what we need, you are there to tell us, to remind us, to give us the instructions of your word, to pour out your character, your morality, your truth. When we fight with it, you still continue to do the same. When we rebel against it, you still continue to pursue. When we kneel down before you, you embrace us when we repent. You are such a great, great father. Lord, as we take these next few moments to celebrate the work of Jesus Christ on the cross to remember the work of your son may we continually let words of praise flow from our lips may our heart may our life be in response to your great gift is just complete submission to your will. We will go wherever you send us. We will speak to whomever you send us to. Father, may we seek to glorify you by living the gospel, a life of righteousness and holiness. You are so good, Father. We just pray this in your holy name. Amen. Well, it tells us, the word tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, I received from the Lord, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. Gentlemen, if you would please pass out the bread.
fellow Steve, would you mind asking the blessing on the body? Amen. He said, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup. Gentlemen, if you would please pass out the cup. If you would please ask the blessing on the blood. Lord, we just thank you for what you said in the word there. And it's just for our salvation. Our situation is bad. But if we know that we can't do all of that, we can just thank you for the money. Amen. He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's due as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. If you would stand with me as we, as we close. Normally we, we sing a song, but I'd like to read to you a piece of scripture. As we go on our way, instead today, from the beginning of Psalm 34, since we already referenced the middle of it, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. 
They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you who saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Heavenly Father, as we have stated, you are truly good. May we take these words to heart. May we taste what is good. May we long for what is good. May we drink of the rivers of life that is only found through you. Father, may we remember as we leave here today that in our fearing of you, we show awe, we show respect, we show humility, we show wisdom. Father, by fearing, we have the promise that you are with those who fear and love you for all of eternity. May that be said of every person here today. Lord, we just ask this in your name. And all the church said, amen. amen. God bless. We have some coffee and snacks out back if you want to stick around for some fellowship. <laughs>